Well, good evening. It's always a pleasure to join together with you on Wednesday evenings as we are continuing with our study on the book of Daniel. And I want to take this opportunity to thank you for joining us. I trust that this has been enlightening and encouraging to you. And as we look tonight at Daniel chapter 2, because of the length of the chapter, I'm not going to take the time to read it in its entirety. We'll be referring to it throughout the study. If you've not already taken the time to read Daniel 2, I encourage you to do so following our um, live stream tonight, or you may want to grab your Bible and follow along as we go through the study. But as chapter 2 begins, we discover that King Nebuchadnezzar had risen to great power and was striving for world supremacy. Babylon had already swallowed up Assyria and had overwhelmingly defeated Egypt. Babylon was noted not only for its conquest and victories, but also for its great strength and beauty, which had been restored by Nebuchadnezzar. He renovated the city throughout, constructing magnificent walls and gates and surrounding the city with several lines of fortification. He then constructed a new palace, and on its grounds, he constructed the celebrated Hanging Gardens, which the Greeks numbered among the seven wonders of the world. Chapter 2 tells us that in the midst of Nebuchadnezzar's excessive self-pride and prosperity, God revealed himself to him in a series of dreams. One night, his spirit became so troubled as he was dreaming that he could not sleep. And even though it may not have been during an hour when the court was in session, he demanded that his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers to appear before him to interpret the dream we discover here in verse 2. When they all were assembled, they asked the natural question of the king about the content of his dream. He informed them, however, that he was not going to tell them what the dream was about. And if they would not tell him what he had dreamed in its interpretation, they would be cut into pieces and their houses turned into piles of rubble. Now, this was no idle threat, as ancient monarchs were known for cruel and unusual punishments. Bible scholars are divided as to whether or not Nebuchadnezzar purposely withheld knowledge of the dream or if he did not remember the dream well enough to communicate it to his counselors. There was a possibility that Nebuchadnezzar who had inherited these counselors from his father, was somewhat impatient with their claims to supernatural powers and knowledge, and he wanted to test them to see if indeed they were authentic. Though the counselors pleaded with the king to inform them concerning his dream, the king reaffirmed that if they did not tell him the dream and its interpretation, the penalty would be inflicted. When the Chaldean astrologers protested that this was a request that no king had ever made before of his subjects, the king became so angry that he ordered their immediate execution. Daniel and his three companions, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, though classified as wise men, were apparently not present at the original meeting, but they were sought out for execution along with the others. When the commander of the king's guard, Arioch, informed Daniel of the decree, Daniel went into the king and asked for time so that he might interpret the dream for him. Apparently, Nebuchadnezzar had cooled down somewhat, and the thought of this young servant, not yet 20 years of age, being able to interpret the dream, no doubt intrigued him and set Daniel apart from the other counselors with whom he had met with earlier. Daniel left the king and immediately went to his home, and they sent immediately for his three friends to ask them to join him in seeking God in prayer, that they might have the secret of the dream and the interpretation revealed to them. Now, Scripture doesn't tell us how long it was, but shortly after, God revealed to Daniel in a night vision the dream and its interpretation. Daniel immediately gave praise to the Lord in a remarkable poetic utterance. Notice what he says here in verses 20 through 23. It says, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and raises up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I thank you and praise you, O God of my fathers. You have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we ask of you. For you have made known to us the king's demands. Notice, Daniel acknowledges that all wisdom and might belong to the Lord. We also recognize that Daniel 
states the fact that God is the one who changes the seasons. He is the one who raises kings to positions of authority. He is also the one who lowers them. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding, revealing deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness, and we find out that light dwells with him. Friend, the Bible tells us if anyone lacks knowledge, let him ask of the Lord, and it shall be given unto him. So Daniel recognizes that the knowledge that was provided to him was a direct gift from God, and he gives praise to him. Daniel's praise to the Lord revealed his spiritual maturity despite his young age, his careful choice of words, and fitting recognition of the wisdom and the power of God and his mercy in revealing to him the secret of the dream. Daniel reported to Arioch that he would interpret the king's dream, and Arioch immediately hoping to gain favor with the king, went into Nebuchadnezzar and said, in verse 25, I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can tell the king what his dream means. Well, as you can imagine, an immediate audience with the king was granted to Daniel, and he was quick in his answer to the king's question to attribute the revelation to God rather than to any human intelligence. He told Nebuchadnezzar, no wise man, no enchanter, magician, or diviner can explain to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. He has shown King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in days to come. Your dream and the visions that pass through your mind as you lay on your bed are these. Daniel then continues to describe the vision and said that Nebuchadnezzar had seen a great image an enormous, dazzling statue, awesome in appearance, that appeared before him in his dream. The image was larger than the normal stature of a man, and the size of the statue caused him to respond in fear. Daniel states that the head of the statue was made of pure gold, and the upper part of the body, its chest and its arms, were made of silver. The lower part of the body and the thighs were made of bronze, the legs of iron, and the feet partly of iron, and partly of baked clay. Daniel continued by stating that Nebuchadnezzar saw a rock that was cut out, but it was not cut out with human hands, and that it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and smashed them. The result of the impact of the rock on the statue was that the statue broke up into fine pieces and became like chaff on a threshing floor. He then saw the chaff blown away, so that all the debris of the statue disappeared. Daniel concluded by stating that the rock that Nebuchadnezzar saw strike the statue became a huge mountain and filled the whole earth. Now, as Daniel was reciting the details of the dream, either the king was reminded of the dream that he had had, or it confirmed the parts that he remembered. In any event, he was amazed that Daniel could tell him the dream. And after telling the king what he had dreamed, Daniel then proceeded to give the interpretation. He reminded Nebuchadnezzar that he was a great king and that God had given him a great dominion and glory, not only over men, but beasts as well. He declared to Nebuchadnezzar, You, O king, are the head of gold. Daniel explained that the upper part of the body represented another kingdom that was inferior to the kingdom of Babylon and that it would be followed by a third kingdom, one of bronze, which would rule over the whole earth. Later in Daniel, these kingdoms are named Medo-Persia, representing the uh, silver portion of the statue, and Greece, representing the bronze part. And it's told to us in Daniel chapter 8, verses 20 and 21. Greece was known for its superior art and culture, and it produced some of the greatest philosophers the world has ever known. It was a military government, and was to extend further over the earth than any preceding kingdom. The Greek Empire, as history tells us, under Alexander the Great, ruled over a territory previously dominated by both Babylon and Medo-Persia. Daniel continues and tells us that the legs of iron represented the old Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire was later broken up into the eastern and western divisions, as represented by the two legs of the image. We are told in history of the Iron Legions of Rome, which held universal sway even up until and during the time that Jesus lived here on earth. But understand, my friend, God was still in command. 
and he caused the Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, to declare a taxation at the very time the Messiah was to be born. This resulted in bringing Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem, fulfilling Micah's prophecy that was given seven centuries before it actually took place of where the Messiah would be born in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, designating Bethlehem of Ephrata as the birthplace of the Messiah. Daniel then moves to the Ten Toes. And the Ten Toes represent the future revised Roman Empire. This is the last part of the image and will be destroyed at the coming of Christ with the saints at the end of the tribulation. The two materials, iron and clay, are believed by many to represent a mixed rule. The clay picturing a rule by the masses who are not united, and the iron by an absolute monarch. Since iron and clay do not mix, they are good symbols of this incompatible type of rule, and gradually the iron will become predominant. The ten toes represent the ten countries that will be formed inside the old Roman Empire. And the Antichrist will rise out of one of these ten countries to rule over the old Roman Empire in the last days. These ten countries will be ruled at first by ten separate kings for the first three and one half years of the tribulation period because it will take this long for the Antichrist to gain full power over the old Roman Empire. Then, for unknown reasons, the, kin the ten kings will submit and give their power to the beast that will rule the last three and one half years, demanding the worship of many nations. This is referenced in Scripture in Daniel chapter 7, also in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and again in Revelation 13 and 17. This is referred to by Bible scholars as the revised Roman Empire. In Nebuchadnezzar's vision, there remained the explanation of the rock that destroyed the image and then grew to be a mountain. This stone symbolizes none other than Jesus Christ at his second coming, at which time he will smite the nations at the Battle of Armageddon and establish his millennial kingdom here on earth. When Christ came to present himself to Israel as her Messiah and Lord, he spoke of himself as the stone which the builders rejected. Jesus himself tells us in Matthew 21, 42, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. According to tradition, during the building of Solomon's temple, which took seven years to complete, the cornerstone for the building arrived from the quarry long before the builders were ready for it to be put into place. There appeared to be no place to store it, so it was rejected and thrown over the hill where it slid down into the Kidron Valley. Once it was there, the briars and the weeds grew up around it, almost concealing it completely from sight. However, as the building progressed, the builders sent the order to the quarry for the cornerstone. The order was returned with a notation that the stone had already been delivered. Then the builders remembered the stone that they had rejected. It immediately was brought up and put into place where it fit perfectly. You know, Luke tells us that Christ came unrecognized by many. John says that he came into his own and his own received him not. But Luke tells us in Luke 20, verses 17 and 18, Then he, that is Jesus, looked at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Whoever falls on that stone will be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. You see, because Israel rejected their Messiah, he became to them a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, is what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 9, verse 20, or excuse me, verse 33. Christ is to the church, which is composed of both Jew and Gentile, the chief cornerstone. He is elect. He is precious. And he who believes in him will by no means be put to shame, is what Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2.6. The cutting out of the stone without hands speaks to us of Christ's miraculous virgin birth. Man played no part in bringing Christ into existence other than the fact that Mary was the vessel that the Holy Spirit chose to conceive Jesus Christ in. 
we find out that the imagery of the stone becoming a great mountain filling the entire earth reveals Christ's literal reign on this earth during the millennium. And notice it is a perfect kingdom. Christ was not tainted by the Adamic nature, the, the sinful nature of Adam, but rather he was the only begotten Son of God, 100% God, 100% man. The destruction of the Gentile world powers is an event, not a process, and will be fulfilled by Christ at his second coming. Well, the interpretation of the dream, as you can only imagine, left Nebuchadnezzar overwhelmed. He immediately fell on his face before Daniel and commanded that an offering and an incense be presented to him. His reaction to Daniel's revelation was profound. Notice he says to Daniel here in verse 47, Truly your God is the God of gods. He is the Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, since you could reveal this secret. Friend, if Nebuchadnezzar was searching for truth about the God of heaven, he had a dramatic introduction to him by Daniel being able to give him the interpretation because God had revealed it. As a result of Daniel's interpretation of the dream, even though Daniel was still quite young, he was given the high rank of ruler over the entire province of Babylon and was placed in charge of all of its wise men. This was especially remarkable because Daniel was not a Babylonian, but rather a Jew and a foreigner. However, notice that Daniel did not forget the part that Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, otherwise known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, had in the prayer which led to the revelation of the dream. And friend, I'm a firm believer that there is power in numbers. The Bible tells us that one shall put to flight a thousand, two shall put to flight ten thousand. And I believe if ever there was a time that you and I needed to stand together in unity in prayer for our country and for our fellow man, it's in this day and hour in which we live. I believe that the hand of prophecy is pointing to the soon return of Jesus Christ. And as we see this vision that King Nebuchadnezzar had in Daniel giving the interpretation of the dream, we are living in the last days where there is going to be a revision and restoration of the old Roman Empire. I personally believe that the Antichrist is alive today. I can't tell you who he is. I cannot tell you what nation he's going to come from. But if ever there was a time that the world is looking for a superman, a man that has the answers to restore world peace and is cause, uh, to bring about the, the answers to the world's dilemma in which we are living, it's in this day and time in which we live. I've said it many times, and I'll say it again. Now is the day of salvation. If you're watching this telecast and you have not yet received Jesus Christ into your life, I would encourage you, oh friend, by all means, yield your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ. Recognize that he loves you. Recognize that he died on the cross for you and that he desires to spend an eternity with you. Well, Daniel asked King Nebuchadnezzar to appoint his three friends over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel himself remained in the court of the king. In one brief day, Daniel, having interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream, and his three companions who had joined with him in prayer for the interpretation, were raised from the position of lowly slaves to positions of high authority in the province of Babylon. Up to this time, no comprehensive prophecy had been given concerning the times of the Gentiles, which began with Nebuchadnezzar, and will end with the second coming of Christ. It's interesting to note that Daniel continued to serve the king as an executive administrator in the Babylonian Empire until Nebuchadnezzar's death in 562 B.C. And as we shared last week, Daniel actually served under four kings, Nebuchadnezzar, his son Belshazzar, then Belshazzar's Babylonian Empire was overthrown by the Medes and the Persians, and Darius the Mede came to authority, and then Cyrus the Persian, overthrew the Medo-Persian, uh, Medes rather, and, and combined the Medo-Persian Empire together, and Daniel also served under him. Well, next week, we'll be studying chapter 3 that relates the story of God's deliverance of Daniel's three friends from the fiery furnace. I want to thank you for joining us this evening, and I look forward to seeing you this coming Sunday at 10 a.m. May the Lord richly bless you, and let your lights shine forth before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Have a great evening.